Hey everybody, welcome back to the second edition of my Picks and Sight for Dummies Like Me course. Today we're gonna to explain the user interface and make sure that you feel comfortable using Picks and Sight. I know from experience that it can be very overwhelming and confusing knowing where to go, when you need to do certain things and more. First, let's talk about the process console over here. One of the most annoying things that people have to deal with is the process console. Because anytime you do something, this thing pops up. To make matters worse, if you have the stick functionality turned on, then this will never go away. So if you ever see the little orange icon here and you want this thing to disappear, just click on the stick button and there it goes. What you don't want to do for any of these tools here, whether that's the Format Explorer, the Process Console, whatever, do not click on the X. When you click on the X, now it's gone forever. I mean, it'll come back eventually, but that's a problem I see people have is they come in here they close out of these things and they don't know how to get them back. If you need to get them back, go up to View, Explore Windows, and then click on anything that you're missing or just click on all of them, frankly. We also need to grab the Process Console. There we go. Another problem that people have is in the Process Explorer. This is actually a very powerful tool, so let's talk about this for a second. The Process Explorer, which has the gear icon, this is a fast, easy way to access anything you need here in Pixin Sight. And up top, we have a search window. So at any time, if I or another instructor says you want to grab DBE next or channel combination, whatever it is, the fastest way to do that is come up to your search window and then start typing in the name of that tool. For example, channel. Anything with channel in the name is now visible. If I want channel extraction, channel combination, whatever, I can click on it. Then I double click on it. And there's a tool right here. Maybe I'm looking for a script though, like create HDR image. Even those are now available here from our process explorer. What I was trying to show you though is that we have this handy reference documentation for a lot of the tools. This explains what the tool does and how to use it. Whether that's SCNR, which doesn't have anything unfortunately, or star exterminator. Okay, finally, blur exterminator. It has all this valuable information. The problem though, is that this takes up a lot of real estate on your screen. And if you wanna get rid of all this stuff, come down to the lower left where you see two arrows and it should say hide extension if you hover over it. That will collapse the optional menu and get it out of your way. This is a very important thing to know. Now we have a much less cluttered interface. Next, I wanna to touch on the background here because if you watch anybody else's videos, very often you're gonna see a whole list of crap here on the right. Those are all the same thing that we have right here. For example, Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator, Noise Exterminator, SCNR. I'm just gonna grab a bunch of tools that we're actually gonna use. So what people like to do is minimize all this stuff. And you can minimize by clicking on this button right here. It's technically called Shade, but I refer to it as Minimize because Shade, nobody's heard of that before. And so what people will do is over on the right here, they'll have everything in their usual workflow. For some people, maybe step one is to create a color photo, which they'll do with channel combination maybe. And for that reason, they'll have channel combination at the top. Then maybe their next step is to run SPCC. I'll have that one. Then blur exterminator, who knows? I'm just gonna put some things right here. And in this way, they can quickly come through and do all their normal things just by double clicking on it, running this on the photo, etc. However, I find that this really clutters things up and for me it's just as fast to come over here and I've got access to my recently used and my most used. So for this reason I do not bother with all this stuff here. I find it much more easy and visually appealing to use the Process Explorer. Just understand that that's why I'm not going to bother showing you how to do all this stuff because I don't like doing it. Okay, you're starting to get a handle on the interface Let's go through and just do some very basic processing. That way you can see how this works. First, we'll go to File, Open. And I've got a bunch of different objects, but let's take a look at some Southern Hemisphere data from my buddy Stu down there in New Zealand. Stu has captured some amazing data, which I'll be processing as part of my deep space course. So you want to check that out. And because he's shooting with a monochrome camera, he's got red, green, blue, H alpha and oxygen data. Why don't we take a look at that data? Pretty amazing, right? And this is just the oxygen data. We've got H alpha, red, green, and blue. This is already highlighting a problem with Pixinsight though. When you've got all these photos loaded up, it gets very cluttered. 
and the names of the files are just completely insane. For these reasons, I always recommend you start off by renaming your photos. You can do that by double clicking on the file name here. I like to call this your name tag. When you double click on the name tag, you can call it whatever you want to. Because this image was taken with a green filter though, I'm going to call it G. PixInsight is case sensitive, so make sure that you're either doing uppercase or lowercase g consistently to make your life easier. I'm going to go with uppercase. Now we just have a letter G that's much easier to see. And I can even minimize this photo or, more accurately, shade the photo and put that up over here. I'll do the same thing for all of my photos, or technically Stu's photos. So we've got red here. I'll do uppercase R, shade it. Looks like this one is H for H alpha, O for oxygen, and finally we have blue. Another problem that you might run into is that when you're coming over here to the left, you might accidentally hover over your process console or anything else. Remember, you don't want to close this out, just get your mouse away from it and it will disappear. Unless you have the stick turned on, which, you know, it's never going to disappear. So look for the orange button, turn that off. There we go. This is a good reason to keep your images away from the left though, that way you're not accidentally bringing this stuff up all the time. At this point, I have my red, green, and blue photos, and then the oxygen and H alpha. One of the nice things with PixInsight is that when you have everything minimized like this, you can move them around and stay organized, which is very important, especially when you're working with a monochrome camera. Let's say I want to create a color photo. There's a lot of different ways to do this, going from very simple to incredibly advanced. Of course, we're just going to stick with the simple option today. For this, you'll go to the Process Explorer, and I want you to type in Channel up top. We're looking for Channel Combination. I've got that right here. I can double click on it. And this will be the perfect way to explain how PixInsight works because you're going to see these weird triangles, squares, and circles all the time, and those don't really correlate very well to what you might be used to in Photoshop, for example. First, let's get our images loaded in. We have a red, green, and blue field right here. There's three different ways to fill in these fields. The easiest way to do this is to click on the field and then enter the file name of the photo that you want to map to the red color channel. Because I named my photo uppercase R, I'll just type in uppercase R, G, and B for red, green, and blue. Alternatively, you can click on the little box here and select it from the drop-down menu. The third way to do this is to actually have your file loaded up here, drag the name tag over, and drop it in the field. Once you've got red, green, and blue mapped appropriately though, now we need to decide which button to click on, the triangle, the square, or the circle. Let's start with the triangle. If I drag the triangle and drop it somewhere on the background, it creates process 01. If I double click on this, it just brings up channel combination. If I click on the square, we get an error. Cannot execute instance on view R. Channel combination can only be executed on RGB color images. What does that even mean? Well, we'll explain it here in a minute. If the square or the triangle didn't work, let's try the circle. Finally, we have a color photo, but it's very dark. So what I want you to understand is that these three buttons do very different things depending on the context of what you're doing. The triangle, this is more for like targeted things, like if I want to apply a star exterminator to this image, then what I can do is grab star exterminator, drag and drop the triangle onto the photo, that will apply it. The square applies whatever you're trying to do here to your most recently activated photo. For this reason, it can be very tricky because maybe you're trying to access this photo with Star Exterminator. But recently you clicked on O. If I run Star Exterminator now by clicking on the square, see right here it says processing view O. Well, that means it's affecting the oxygen data, which I didn't want. And so if we take a look at the oxygen data, there's no more stars. So I hope that makes sense. What I'm trying to show you is that the square is a bit risky because there's a chance it's not going to apply to the photo that you wanted to. The triangle is usually the safest option because you're actually physically dragging this and dropping it on the photo that you want. Alternatively though, let's say you have something really advanced. Who knows, maybe SPCC. You've got everything kind of configured the way you want it to. 
I'm just doing something weird for a minute here. Just understand that once you've got your tool all calibrated like this, if you want to do it again for the second time, well, if I drag the triangle onto the background, this copies all of my settings. So let's say I want to run this on another photo in 10 minutes. Well, now that I have this new process here, I can double click on it and everything is left to the values that I had set before. And in this way, you can go through and process your images throughout the workflow. So this is a good trick to know. The only problem is process 02 is not very descriptive. And that's why for anything that's minimized, these little process icons, you can click on the N. It's a very small N, but when you click on it, you can now rename the process, which in my case is SPCC, and you can add whatever you want to it, the identifier. Let's say S, I don't know. I have a problem though. Invalid identifier. What you're going to find is that Pixinsight is very, very precise with your naming conventions. And the reason that this is invalid is because I have a space. Pixinsight does not like spaces. You either have to do everything as one word or do underscores or hyphens or anything else. So if I do SPCC underscore S, that would be fine. These are all the little things that are going to trip you up as you go through and you watch somebody else's video. So I want to make sure we cover all that today. All right, let's get back on track. I've just been throwing a lot of stuff at you, but let's get back to the workflow. So if we recall, this was our image that we created with channel combination. We have red, green, and blue. That created a new photo, which in this case is called image 06. Image 06 means nothing to me though. For this reason, let's rename it. We'll double click on the name tag and we'll call it RGB. Now for one of the most powerful tools here in Pixinsight, which is the screen stretch. If you hit Ctrl or Command A, that will automatically stretch the photo. And nine times out of 10, it does a fantastic job. If Ctrl or Command A is not working for some strange reason, the manual way to do this is to go back to your Process Explorer and look for Screen Transfer Function. The fastest way to do that is to type it in up top, Screen. I'll double click on it. And I'm sure you've seen this tool before if you watched any Pixinsight videos. When I hit Ctrl or Command A, that's the exact same thing as clicking on the nuclear button right here. And very often what will happen is you'll have a color cast to your photo. A simple way to fix this is to unlink the RGB channels. So you just turn off the link button right there. Now Pixinsight is free to analyze the photo and adjust these sliders to neutralize the color cast. All you have to do is hit Ctrl or Command A for a second time or click on the nuke. And theoretically the color cast has now been neutralized. Although to be honest, I liked it back in the original version. I'm not saying that you should do this necessarily, but it can come in handy to understand that at any time, if your image just looks really strange, try unlinking the RGB channels and nuking the photo again to see the preview a bit better. Let's say hypothetically that we like what we have right here and we don't want to do anything else to the photo. This would be very unusual, but I just want to give you an example. If you want to save this photo right now the way you see it, then you can go up to File, Save As, and by default, the type might be XISF, which is a Pixinsight proprietary format. That's fine, but if you want to take this image into any other program, like Photoshop, for example, those programs are not going to understand XISF. It's a foreign language to them. You need to change this to a language that they might understand, like English. So we'll change it to TIFF, which is a universal language, if you will. Alternatively, you could save it as a JPEG, but TIFF is lossless. JPEG is lossy. I'll just do JPEG today, though, to demonstrate a point. Quality we need to set to 100, that way there's no problems there. Embed the ICC profile, and then hit OK. If we take a look now at the RGB photo, well that doesn't look right. What happened to all the colors and the contrast? This is a fundamental aspect of Pig Insight that you need to understand. This photo, even though it looks good, is still in the linear state. And if the image is in the linear state, then technically it still looks like this. It's very dark. The screen transfer function that we've applied is just temporary, and it's really only applicable here in Pixinsight. And if you pay attention closely, you'll see that there's a green line under the file name RGB. That's kind of an indicator to tell you that the photo is still in a linear state, and it has a screen transfer function applied to it. If I turn off the preview, then the green line disappears because we're no longer doing a preview stretch, and the photo is still very dark. And generally, when you're editing your photos, you want to stay in this linear state as long as possible. That gives you the most flexibility and the best performance out of your data. For this reason, stretching is actually one of the last things we do in most workflows. 
Again, understand though that when I'm talking about stretching, this is a temporary stretch. Still, the photo is very dark. To permanently stretch the photo, which we'll do at the end of the workflow, we need another tool. For this, we'll go to the Process Explorer and look for Histogram Transformation. We'll type in Histogram. Super easy to grab that one as well. And now I have another concept that I want to throw at you. I know I'm doing a lot today, but we're going to just power through it. In a number of the tools here in PixInsight, there's a check mark icon. This should always be turned on for the safest results. Watch what happens up here when I turn the check mark on and off. We go from screen transfer function to screen transfer function RGB. This will allow us to confirm that we're actually targeting the photo that we want. If I click on the O image, now it says screen transfer function O or B or again RGB. We need to do the same thing for histogram transformation because right now it says no view selected. If I turn on the check mark though, my most recently targeted photo is RGB, so it says RGB. This is why I want you to really pay attention when you're going through and watching other tutorials because it's very easy to get confused and apply things to the wrong photo, but the check mark confirms that you're actually working on the intended image. If I want to apply the stretch that we see here permanently to the photo, here's what we'll do. We're going to drag the triangle from the screen transfer function to the bottom of the histogram window. If you're on a Windows computer, then you should see the hourglass icon when you're in the right spot. If you're on a Mac, you will not see that hourglass icon. I don't know why, but just be aware of that. Really what we're trying to do is put this in the beige portion at the bottom of the window here and then let go. Again, I'm dragging the triangle and putting it down here. What that's doing behind the scenes is it's copying our automated stretch that we have right here to the histogram. Everything is still temporary. The real data of the photo is still here in this bottom window. To apply this preview stretch that we see to the real data, we have two choices. We can either drag the triangle from the histogram window to our RGB image, that way we know it goes to the right place, or we could be a bit more risky and click on the square, which as you saw earlier, this is going to apply to any photo that you recently clicked on. In this case, if I click on O, it's going to apply that stretch to O, which is probably not ideal. And this is why I want you to get in the habit of just dragging and dropping your triangles onto the relevant photo. In my case, I'll go from the histogram transformation, I'll drag the triangle onto this image. Well, now what happened? The image went white. It's just one of those weird things with pigs in sight. It's not as streamlined as it could be, but fundamentally the issue is that we've multiplied the effect because we still have the auto stretch active on permanently stretched data now. Very simply, you'll click on the reset button down here and over here. And now finally, we have stretched the data officially, permanently. And if I save this image now as a JPEG, and we compare that to the original, the original was very dark because we hadn't stretched it. Now we have the stretched image. I realized that was very overwhelming, but we're going to cover this a lot more, especially in my deep space course. But fundamentally what we're doing is we're dragging a triangle. Then you can either drag this triangle or click on the square. I tend to just click on the square, to be honest. And then we reset, reset. I want you to memorize this little jingle. Drag the triangle, click on the square, reset, reset. Drag the triangle, click on the square, reset, reset. Because if you're trying to stretch your photos at the end of the workflow, all you have to do is grab your histogram transformation, your screen transfer function, turn on the check marks, drag the triangle, click on the square, reset, reset. That applies the permanent stretch. Okay, well, I hope you're starting to understand the basics now of the interface. I realize it's a bit overwhelming. I know it was for me. It took me many months to really master it. But the whole point of this course and some of my others is to simplify everything. That way, even if you're new to the hobby, you can still go through and get some great images. But that's all I've got for you in today's video. In part three, we're going to go through from the very beginning of the workflow and stack our images. And we'll talk about some of the problems that come along with that. So stay tuned and I'll see you guys in another video.